This is the second lecture for the introduction to capillarity. This lecture is entitled Cylindrical Surfaces, Capillary Bridges, and Drop Shape Analysis. Having introduced the young Laplace equation and reviewed the concepts of curvature for spherical surfaces and interfaces, the last lecture ended with the discussion of applications. This included capillary rise and fall and development of the Lucas-Washburn equation. There are a number of practical situations where this equation can be applied to provide useful information on structure and processes. In a more superficial assessment, we can divide capillary openings leading into materials as pores and cracks. For pores, the openings can be modeled with equivalent circular areas and the assumption of spherical surfaces and interfaces. Cracks are better treated using rectangular cross sections, where the width is assumed to be quite small relative to the length. Such openings can be modeled as cylindrical surfaces and interfaces, which is discussed next. In this lecture, the capillary bridge and capillary adhesion are also examined, and we finish up with a discussion of real drop shapes and an introduction to the Brashforth and Adams treatment for dealing with the influence of gravity on meniscus curvature. Moving on, we consider a second basic shape, a cylinder with a radius r. The curvature of cylindrical surfaces and interfaces is found to be 1 over r. Examples where surfaces and interfaces can be approximated as being cylindrical include menisci that form on the surfaces of vertical plates, for example in the Wilhelmy plate measurement, menisci that form between parallel plates resulting in capillary rise and fall, and those that develop along the sides of a liquid bridge that forms between two plates or between a plate and a cylinder and other combinations. As with the sphere, the cylinder is an idealized shape for a real meniscus. Real menisci often vary from this, sometimes significantly due to the influence of gravity. However, the examination of this shape is still quite useful in teaching capillary concepts. So let's begin with a schematic description for finding curvature values for a cylindrical shape. The first step is to identify the point of interest P and place our unit normal there which defines the tangent plane. The choice of a point if placed on the curved surface of the cylinder is irrelevant because the curvature is constant across the entire surface if we're neglecting the ends of the cylinder. A vertical plane is passed through the normal and parallel to the cylinder axis to produce a curve of intersection. The curve in this case is a straight line, which is only fit by a circle of infinite radius resulting in a curvature of zero for the vertical plane. The horizontal plane, which is rotated 90 degrees from the vertical plane, is passed through the unit normal perpendicular to the cylinder axis, producing a circular curve of intersection with a radius equal to that of the cylinder. Thus, the total curvature is equal to 1 over r plus 0, or simply 1 over r, where r is the radius of the cylinder. Now let's develop the expression from our equations. This begins by collapsing the cylinder into its two-dimensional representation, which consists of two parallel lines separated by a distance 2 times r, where r is the radius of the cylinder. For situations where we apply the cylindrical meniscus approximation, the ends of the cylinder can be neglected without introducing significant error. To determine curvature, we first place the x-axis underneath the cylinder, and the z-axis bisects the shape. Only half the cylinder needs to be considered, so we choose the portion which is within the first quadrant. A unit normal is placed on the outside of the cylinder. Here, the arc length is actually a vertical line. That is, phi is a constant and equal to pi over 2. From our definition for the curvatures in the vertical and horizontal planes, we again find that the total curvature is equal to 1 over r, where r is the radius of the cylinder. Let's again show how the curvature is related to the pressure change across a curved surface or interface. In this case, it's cylindrical. Here we have a cylinder of radius r consisting of phase i surrounded by a second phase j which can be a liquid or a vapor. As discussed, we expect the phase on the concave side of the curvature to have a higher pressure than the phase on the convex side. 
Bisecting the cylinder, which is a mechanical equilibrium, with an imaginary cutting plane allows us to isolate a free body on which tension forces and the fluid pressure are acting. The horizontal equation for the equilibrium includes the resultant from the surface tension acting along its edges, which is the surface tension multiplied by the length of the two sides neglecting the ends. This is balanced by the pressure force, which is a pressure across the interface multiplied by the cross-sectional area of the cylindrical section. The difference across a curved interface is the capillary pressure, so the equilibrium equation can be rearranged to the Young-Laplace equation for a cylindrical surface or interface, where the curvature is given as the inverse of the cylinder's radius. As with the sphere, this equation applies not only to a cylinder, but also to any portion of a surface or interface that is assumed to have a cylindrical shape. Let's now return to the topic of capillary rise. Here, a pair of parallel plates are placed close enough to each other to form a capillary opening. Unless the contact angle for the liquid on the plate surfaces is 90 degrees, the liquid contained between the plates will either rise above that of the liquid surrounding the plates or fall below it. Again, this behavior is explained with the Young-Laplace equation. Our underlying assumption is that the meniscus that forms between the plates is a cylindrical surface where contributions from the ends of the cylinder are being neglected. Here, we have two long parallel plates that have been introduced into a liquid at a separation distance d. If the liquid has a contact angle of less than 90 degrees on the plate surfaces, the meniscus is curved upwards, resulting in capillary rise. R capital R, is the radius of the curvature. This quantity is difficult to determine, but it is related to the separation distance between the plates through the cosine of the contact angle. Making this substitution and the Young-Laplace equation provides an expression for the magnitude of the capillary pressure across the surface. Now we move in the other direction and consider a liquid that forms a contact angle on the walls of the plates of greater than 90 degrees. This produces a cylindrical meniscus that is curved downwards, resulting in capillary depression or fall. Again, a relationship can be found between the radius of curvature for the meniscus and the separation distance between the plates. Its substitution into the Young-Laplace equation provides an expression for the magnitude of the capillary pressure under these circumstances. Similar to our derivation of an expression for capillary rise and fall involving a cylindrical capillary tube, we can derive a general expression based on an axis, the z-axis, which measures the distance of the bottom of the meniscus from the surface of the liquid well outside the plates. This is another expression of Juren's law. This example addresses the potential error involved in modeling menisci as cylindrical surfaces and interfaces, provided is the Young-Laplace equation for a rectangular surface or interface. We are asked to estimate the error introduced when the ends of the rectangle are ignored. For this, we develop an expression for the percentage of capillary rise neglected using this assumption. Obviously, the percent error is dependent on the relative length and width of the rectangle under consideration. Using values in the typical range for such calculations, 20 millimeter long plates separated by 0.5 millimeters, we estimate an error of less than 1%. Here, a pair of parallel plates separated by a distance d are placed horizontally into a liquid bath. The liquid has a contact angle of theta on the surfaces of the plates. The x-axis measures the distance the liquid moves through the opening between the plates. This could be considered a model for a capillary crack. We apply the hagen poiseuille equation for which delta P is measured as the difference in pressures acting at the ends of the plates. The difference in pressure between points A and B is defined as the change in external pressure. Assuming the contact angle is less than 90 degrees, we add the magnitude of the capillary pressure and substitute it in for the pressure gradient for the hagen poiseuille equation. The pressure gradient is constant across the plates. The equation can be rearranged to provide an estimate of the rate at which the liquid moves through the capillary opening, the Lucas-Washburn equation for parallel plates. Solving this differential equation provides a relationship between the penetration distance and time. These equations also apply to the movement of the meniscus in the opposite direction to counter the external gradient. If we orient the plates to the vertical position, 
the pressure change becomes a function of height. To solve this, we would use the same approach that we use with the vertical cylindrical tube. This is left as an exercise. This example is a bit more challenging, but it makes a couple of important points. It asks us to use the young Laplace equation to find a relationship between the height h of the meniscus on the vertical plate and the contact angle for the liquid on the plate surface. There are several ways to develop this equation, but we will apply the hydrostatics approach previously demonstrated. For this, an arbitrary point p is selected on the curved surface and our normal vector is placed there. Next, a couple of points where the pressure should be equal are selected, point a below p and point b. All the contributions are listed in our balance equation and it is simplified. Here, we're subtracting off the magnitude of the capillary pressure. For this, we start with the basic definition. Cylindrical symmetry is assumed, which indicates that curvature only exists in the XC plane, so we use the expression introduced earlier for finding the curvature of a plane curve. This requires a few angle relations. This allows us to write down the magnitude of curvature in terms of theta, which is the contact angle when we reach the wall. Also, from the differential arc length, we have the following. These are plugged back into our balance equation, variables are separated, and we integrate to obtain the desired result. Having gone through this example, think about meniscus curvature and why capillary rise is measured from the bottom of the meniscus. Here we apply the results from the last example in combination with the Wilhelmy equation for which the contact angle of a liquid on a plate surface is not zero. The experimental setup allows the measurement of both the force on the plate and the height of the meniscus. From the equations, a reasonable first step would appear to be the squaring of both the cosine and sine functions. Summing these, we can set it equal to 1. From here, it is a bit of algebra to find expressions for both the surface tension and contact angle in terms of the measured quantities, plate dimensions, and the density of the liquid. The final basic geometric shape considered here is a hyperboloid, which will be used to model capillary bridges that form between parallel surfaces. The point of interest for this shape is its narrowest region halfway down the structure. The point P and unit normal can be placed anywhere on the perimeter at this height to mark the tangent plane. The same procedure is used to determine the principal curvature values. A vertical plane is passed through the normal and parallel to the shape's symmetry axis to produce a curve of intersection. In this case, the circle tangent to the surface fitting the curve of the intersection is outside the shape. That is, the normal is situated inside the circle pointing towards its center. As a result, the radius of curvature for the vertical plane is negative. The horizontal plane, which is rotated 90 degrees from the vertical plane, is passed through the unit normal perpendicular to the hyperboloid's axis of symmetry, producing a circular curve of intersection. This radius is positive. Thus, for this shape, there is one positive curvature value and one negative value. The three-dimensional hyperboloid collapses down to a two-dimensional hyperbola. As before, the x-axis is placed directly under or over the figure, and the axis of symmetry, the z-axis, is passed through the center of the hyperbola. Here is the equation for a hyperbola with semi-axis a and b. Curvature values will be calculated at a height of z equal to 1 half h, halfway up the hyperbola, where the normal is placed. Using the equations outlined in the last lecture, the first and second order derivatives are used to estimate the curvatures for the vertical and horizontal planes. For 1 half h, curvatures are in terms of constants a and b. The semi-axis value a is the radius of the circle centered at the axis of symmetry for 1 half h while negative a over b squared is the radius of the circle tangent to the hyperbola at 1 half h. This result for a hyperboloid is interesting because it involves both positive and negative contributions to the curvature. Such surfaces and interfaces form when flat objects are brought together and bridged through a liquid drop. This is known as a capillary bridge. Here we consider a simple capillary bridge formed between a pair of parallel flat plates separated by a distance h and attached through a circular drop of liquid with a contact angle of theta on the plate surfaces. We make some simplifying assumptions here to apply the Young-Laplace equation. First, 
H is restricted to be small relative to the radius of the bridging drop. In other words, the capillary pressure contribution due to the curvature in the horizontal plane can be neglected relative to that generated by the curvature in the vertical plane. Furthermore, it is assumed that the radius of curvature determined at one half H for the vertical plane fits the meniscus throughout the gap between the plates. In general, it is assumed that the vertical radius of curvature at one half H determines the capillary pressure acting on the system. With these restrictions, let's go ahead and determine the magnitudes for the capillary pressures acting on a system when the contact angle is less than 90 degrees. Under these circumstances, this is our meniscus. The circle here is located outside of the shape. As we did before, we first find a relationship between the radius of curvature and measurable dimensions of the capillary. Plugging this in, we obtain an expression for the magnitude of the capillary pressure. Next, consider the same system and assumptions, but for a contact angle greater than 90 degrees, which reduces a curvature fit by a circle located within the shape. Following the same procedure, a relationship is found between the radius of curvature of the meniscus and measurable dimensions of the capillary, which can then be plugged into the Young-Laplace equation to produce an expression for the magnitude of the capillary pressure in these situations. With the relationship for the magnitude of capillary pressure established, we can look at the impact of a capillary bridge on the interaction between two surfaces. Once again, consider the pressure at two points, point A and point B. In this case, a pressure difference exists. The pressure at A is simply the atmospheric pressure that surrounds the bridge structure, while at point B, the liquid drop is compressed by the atmospheric pressure, which is countered by the capillary pressure. So we subtract off the magnitude of the capillary pressure for a contact angle less than 90 degrees. The results indicate that a pressure gradient exists across the meniscus and across the plates. This is a general result. In other words, the same equation would be found if we assumed non-wetting conditions. The force acting on the plates as a result of the bridge can be found by multiplying its cross-sectional area, which is the area of the drop in contact with the plates forming the bridge. To calculate this, we use the other radius of curvature. Another contribution to the interaction is a vertical component of the wetting line tension. These together produce a push and pull effect. Keep in mind that the push can either be the plates being pushed together or compressed under partial wetting conditions or pushed apart under non-wetting conditions. Here we apply the equation just developed. The question asks us to determine the maximum force required to separate the plates and the contact angle where this occurs. To find the maximum force, we find the maximum in the equation with respect to contact angle. As we might expect, the maximum occurs for complete wetting that is a contact angle of zero. But keep in mind, this eliminates the contribution from the wetting line. In other words, capillary pressure really governs the extent of this interaction. Next, the properties and capillary dimensions are entered, resulting in a surprisingly large force for such a small drop. Given the inverse relationship between the capillary pressure and the surface separation distance, as the drop is evaporated, this force climbs asymptotically. The climbing compressive forces as water is evaporated is utilized to produce a wide variety of commercial products. Here are images showing the capillary bridges formed between latex particles and paper making fibers. For latex particles, the capillary forces induce not only bonding, but also the sintering of polymer particles to form structures that could be roughly described as continuous films as opposed to a collection of bonded particles. For papermaking fibers, the strong compressive forces induced during drying due to the capillary bridge effect allow for strong hydrogen bonds to form. Although these are physical interactions, the large density of such bonding produces a strong sheet of bonded particles. To this point, only idealized surfaces and interfaces have been considered, for example, spherical and cylindrical, and the influence of gravity has been ignored. For small menisci and or high capillary length liquids, this leads to a tolerable amount of error. However, in many if not most situations, the gravitational force has a significant influence on the shapes of drops, bubbles, and menisci. For example, consider a pendant drop. When suspended in air, gravitational forces tend to stretch the drop out. When suspended in more dense liquid, a drop is compressed due to its buoyancy. 
Techniques for measuring surface and interfacial tension based on drop shape are quite useful, but usually require corrections for such influences. Here we introduce a common approach for making such corrections, and a more specific variable for gauging the influence of gravity on surface and interfacial shapes. For this, let's again look at the planar projection of a pendant drop. The symmetry of the drop means that the radius of curvature in both the vertical and horizontal planes are equal at the drop apex. These are indicated with a small b. Thus, the capillary pressure, the pressure difference between the inside and the outside of the drop at its apex, is given with the Young Laplace equation using these curvatures, curvatures of 1 over b. So, what about the pressure difference at a point a little higher up on the drop surface, at, say, point p? We can estimate this using hydrostatics, finding the pressure at the elevation of point P both inside and outside of the drop, and taking their difference gives us the capillary pressure. This can also be found by applying the young laplace equation at P. Here the curvature values have been left in a mixed general form. Setting these equations equal to one another results in the Bashforth and Adams equation. Before we discuss the equation, let's do a little rearranging. This rearranging produces a seemingly simple form of the equation containing the Bashforth and Adams constant denoted with beta. This is sometimes referred to as a form or shape factor. Like the capillary constant except inverted, this constant gauges the balance of gravitational forces to those resulting from surface tension. However, unlike the capillary constant, it specifically takes into account the shape under consideration using the radius of curvature at its apex. It's essentially a gauge of the ratio of the liquid weight pushing down on the surface or interface and the resistance provided by the surface tension forces for the system under consideration. Based on the value of this constant, we draw conclusions regarding the influence of gravitational forces on, for example, a pendant drop. These include betas equal to zero really only when delta rho is equal to zero, and this results in a spherical drop. Betas greater than zero when delta rho is also greater than zero, that is when the drop density is higher than the fluid surrounding the drop. This results in a prolate or stretch drop. Beta is less than zero when delta rho is less than zero, that is when the drop density is lower than the fluid surrounding it. This results in an oblate or compressed drop. Large beta values, positive or negative, indicate that body forces are large relative to the surface tension, and vice versa. Large beta values, positive or negative, result in greater drop shape modification. Bashforth and Adams solved the differential equation numerically for a broad range of beta values. Tables of such values are available from a variety of sources. Here, an example table for the pendant drop is provided from Arthur Adamson's text on the physical chemistry of surfaces, the fifth edition. The table provides sufficient data to plot the shape of the pendant drop for a beta value of negative 0.45. These tables are now part of software packages that carry out numerical shape matching routines on analyzed drop video images. This identifies the beta constant that best fits the drop shape. With this factor and accurate density values for the phases involved, the surface or interfacial tension can be estimated using the maximum drop radius, which corresponds to the radius at the angle of phi equals pi over 2, or 90 degrees. It should be emphasized that the Bashford and Adams approach is not limited to the pendant drop. The same general approach can be applied to the sessile drop, hanging bubble, sessile bubble, and other curved structures. Finally, we briefly review a common and much more convenient technique used to gauge surface tension from a pendant drop. The technique, which is often referred to as DSDE method, uses two measurements from a drop, its maximum width, denoted DE, and its width at a height DE from the bottom of the drop, denoted DS. Rewriting the Bashforth Adams beta constant in terms of DE, a correction factor denoted H is defined, which includes the beta constant. H is found to strongly correlate with the shape factor S defined as DE over DS. Thus, simple measurements of drop dimensions provides an H value. From this and the densities of the phases involved, an estimate of surface or interfacial tension can be made. This approach is found to provide accurate results when the ratio of capillary tube radius to capillary length is less than about 0.5. This completes lecture two. 
It also completes our introduction to capillarity. It is hoped that the notes and discussion have provided you with the necessary tools, terminology, and understanding to start addressing more complex capillarity issues, which can arise in the study of surface science.